I always go back to what my dad always said to me when I was a kid. At junior rodeos, I would want to, it'd be hot, and I'd want to take my long sleeve shirt off or my hat off. And he was like, listen, do you want your kids to rodeo? Well, yeah. Then you have to live this lifestyle. Like, you have to buy into all of it. We don't just wear long sleeve shirts because we are trying to have a fashion statement. Like, there is a purpose to everything we do. There's a purpose to rodeo events, the dress code, there is a history. And if you aren't doing what you can to be a part of the future, you will not have a future for your kids. I think the biggest thing I wish someone told me was that it would take so long to feel at home. And I was used to kind of the anonymous side of being even in a bigger town or a city. And, but now like, this is where I belong. Like, this is where I want to serve. This is where I want to be. I belong here. Welcome to Breaking the Barrier, a Western lifestyle podcast highlighting those breaking barriers both in and out of the arena. I'm your host, Rebel Soklocha, and you just heard a couple tidbits from two incredible women who are doing just that. This week, I caught up with Kelly Carr Augustine of KC Creations Photography and Haley Miles of Sandhills Blue Photography. They are incredible professionals in the Western media space, but they're both also great assets to their rural communities in the state of Nebraska. They're both photographers and have many of the same values, but their stories are vastly different and their offerings and businesses are pretty different as well. After experimenting with other jobs and other career opportunities, both of them have found themselves back living and working in their home communities. Kelly and Haley can photograph just about anything. Kelly has dabbled all over the Western industry, even shot photos at the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo in Las Vegas, the Miss Rodeo America pageant, does commercial work for STS Ranchware, the list goes on. But her primary focus right now is on senior portrait sessions. Haley, on the other hand, has also done some commercial work in seniors, but her focus is on small town love, rural couples, and Western weddings. That's a lot of backstory on these two women, but I truly believe that they are both the epitome of the spirit of the West and breathing life into the rural communities and the lifestyle that we all love so much. So without further ado, I will quit gabbing and let you listen to their stories. Okay, Kelly, this may be an oversimplification, but where did you start? (laughs) It's so funny because my specialty now is seniors. That's what people know me for. But when I started, I was totally in Western media and um, I started as a journalist and I actually started because I I was a writer, but I started out as a Western journalist and I started realizing that I could make more money (laughs) to pay back student loans if I could photograph my subjects as well as interviewing them. So a lot of times the way it worked is like, I would go out, you know, I might drive three hours for a, um, an interview. And then I would spend all day like doing that and spend another week transcribing and writing it. And then they'd send a photographer out and they'd work for, you know, a couple hours if that, and that would take up the majority of the article. And then, you know, they got paid more than I did. And I was like, Hmm, if I could take my own pictures. Um, So I started learning and um, I guess I get a lot of questions from people like, how did you get involved in, in, how did you become a photographer? Um, How did you break into the industry? And really, I mean, it was A, being coachable and teachable, B, having a desire to you know, do more than what I was asked because nobody was asking me to take pictures. I just saw an opportunity and I was like, Hey, um, this is another opportunity to be creative. You know, can I make it work? And then C, I was constantly asking for feedback. So one of the things that, um, one of the magazines I worked for, they said, Hey, we're going to give you an opportunity to shoot the cover. We're going to send you out with another photographer. And I was really fortunate to work, um, 
for a magazine that was in this owned by the same company as Western Horseman, which is has like absolutely amazing Western photography. And so one of their photo editors came with me and I shot next to him and he gave me feedback. And like, I would take photos and take them to him and say, take them apart, you know, just tell me what's wrong. I don't need to hear what's right about them. I think mm -hmm. they're great. But if they were as great as I thought they were, they would be on the cover of Western Horseman and not sitting in a garbage bin. So what's wrong? And I just like made myself be very coachable because I felt like that was gonna be the fastest, best way to learn. And so kind yeah. of what evolved from that was I had access to the cameras at my office and they didn't care if I was growing my skills, I could check them out. And so um, I started to take them to, well, I would get requests. So when I moved to Texas, I became friends with Roy Cooper and taking my camera to Cliff and Tuff Cooper's high school events. You know, they were freshmen, eighth graders in high school. And I just started photographing more portrait style stuff of them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just how stuff evolved. So yeah. So you grew up in you graduated from Burwell High School right here in Nebraska, I went to did. Oklahoma mm -hmm. State, then migrated to Texas where all of this mm -hmm. was taking place. So you kind of dabbled around taking photos at high school rodeos. If I remember mm -hmm. correctly, you took some photos at high school sporting events um, yes. when did you make that jump from, I mean, I know you were in the press room at the national finals rodeo for Pete's sake. Like you were in yeah. the trenches, um, like doing <laughs> things at this level. And so when yeah. did you decide to take photos more seriously and kind of make that your priority versus journalism? Um, well, it, it kind of evolved taking action shots and things at rodeos to doing more portraits. I, so it started as um, me just taking my camera to like Cliff and Tufts high school rodeos and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, um, Shadow Brazil and Trevor were having a baby and Cliff was graduating high school and Amber and Clint Cooper got married all in the same year. And all of a sudden, I'm their trusted friend, you know, with a camera and they're like, hey, will you do this portrait work for us? And I had already been in journalism for uh, media outlets that were doing print reporting. Um, you know, so I'd be in the press room, the NFR press room as a print reporter, but I can't remember what year. I think I think I got a photo photography pass from AQHA and, it, and it's an application process. Like you can't just go in there and, you know, get that like, hey, I have a camera. That's not really how that stuff works. Um, but, AQHA wanted photos. And so I was able to get a photography pass, which was really exciting. So for several years, I got to shoot in the pit at the NFR, which was amazing. Um, and I mean, just some of the best experiences of my life, but really it was just, it just started through making connections, but like making genuine, authentic connections and not just getting close to people for the purpose of using them. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? You know, yeah, like I was, I was going to go watch the boys high school rodeo because I love them. I, I mean, I do mm -hmm. love them. Like, you know, I was going to go watch yeah. them anyway. I might as well bring my camera. I was going to watch Cliff's basketball games anyway, you know, and it, it started to be something they'd be like, Hey, can you bring your camera? You know, I, and one of my favorite stories to tell is when trust in Brazil was born and he was shadows like, I want newborn pictures. I'm like, awesome. Like, let's find you an awesome newborn photographer. And she's like, no, I want you to do it. And I'm like, uh, no, I, <laughs> I, I don't know anything about that. I have no idea what I'm doing. Like you need to hire a professional. And <laughs> I will still look back at them in this day and go, don't you wish you would have hired a professional shadow? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I wasn't then, but it was also one of those things, you know, iron really sharpens iron and, I just had the philosophy, like, if I'm going to be taking pictures for Trevor and Jetta and they think they're great and magazines are going to call like PSN or um, I had photos on ESPN, just different, different media outlets, they would call and request photos. And I'm like, I, I better be good at what I'm doing. Like, I better yeah. learn this craft, learn this skill. And so I just dove in tried to get the best equipment I could as fast as I could and just really tried to learn and be the absolute best I can be because, you know, 
it and yeah. being around that kind of work ethic too. I mean, I always grew up with parents that have like an amazing work ethic. My parents are ranchers, you know, so there's, um, I, I've always seen great work ethic, but I would apply Trevor's work ethic and his approach to prepping for the NFR, which I was so privileged to get to see for many years. You know, I, mm -hmm. I saw a lot of behind the scenes stuff and I'm like, I can apply that to my photography and get better and, and get, you know, go from mediocre or okay to outstanding and the top of my field, which I don't feel like I'm there yet. You know, I, I'm still learning. I'm still okay. constantly growing my craft. Um, but I feel like, you know, a lot of that work ethic, I really developed towards it when I was kind of put into the, like, hey, you're going to do this because you're our friend and we trust you. And oh, by the way, it's going to be published by a bunch of national media organizations. <laughs> So, okay. So like for a, a calf rober, for instance, they grow up working towards the NFR or, you know, college national finals, whatever, mm -hmm. and they compete and it's that straightforward. But when mm -hmm. you're a media person in the industry, you know, you're not going for a gold buckle necessarily, but getting to <laughs> shoot at the NFR is essentially on that level. Um, yeah. Talk about the experience of what it's like to be in the pit at the Thomas and Mac. And some of the things you did besides shoot at the rodeo, like just give us the rundown of that whole experience. Oh gosh. Well, um, first of all, it, I mean, you have a front row seat. Um, you have to have a, a stomach for, you know, you might have a hoof flying from like a bronc, you know, just inches from your head. You have to know when to duck. Um, you are squeezed like sardines in there. You have to be friendly to other people um developing i just really think developing relationships in the industry and being a person who is you know easy and amenable and helps other people is so key um you know i mean if the prca said hey uh, we need a photo we know you were there absolutely i'm gonna send that and most of the time i'm not gonna be a jerk about it you know not that asking to be paid is is being a jerk everybody deserves to be paid but you know, if they're like, our budget is only this, or we don't have a budget, do you have a photo? Absolutely, because thank you for the, thank you for the photo pass. You know, thank you for there's a there's a lot of that that you have to do. But um, it's very exhilarating. I can still remember one of my favorite things was always the grand entry, just because you can feel the energy in the Thomas and Mac, and you know it from sitting in the stands. But when you're like right there in the front row. There is so much energy behind you and around you, and it's amazing. Um, it was hard for me to be neutral, like to not want to cheer, you know, because I was down there the years that like um, Cliff and or Tough were competing, Trevor was competing, Strand was competing, you know, all the people that I'm really close to, like I wanted to cheer for them, but you kind of have to be more neutral when you are um, there as media. Um, but one of the most exciting things I got to do, and this is just to my day, to this day, one of my favorite memories is, um, I can't remember who it was, but one of the, one of the people in charge said, you know, if you really want to get adventurous, you'll crawl underneath. And I was like, what? So there is a camera. So if you think about the first barrel in barrel racing, most barrel racers first barrel, there's like a camera shot usually from down below where they get like the horse's feet, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's underneath the announcer stand and there's like these two essentially holes for media people or for, <laughs> for cameras. That's one, terrifying. One videographer and one photographer. So one night somebody's like, do you want to, you want to crawl under? And I'm like, yes, I do. Yes. Yes. And that's to my, this day, um, I got this amazing shot of Sherry Servi riding Stingray going around that first barrel. And it is one of my all time favorite pictures. The angle is amazing. The dirt flying towards her camera is amazing. Um, and I was also really good friends with Sherry and her family. And I actually spent Thanksgiving with them a couple of times. Um, and it was just like, it was so awesome to like get that shot of this iconic barrel racer on her iconic horse 
and like somebody that just means a lot to me too. Like I got covered in dirt. It was cold. <laughs> I was disgusting. And also like you have to be on your hands and knees the entire time. There is no like standing up to stretch out. You are like crammed down there for the entire rodeo and you have to go in when they say go in and they close it up and there's no getting out <laughs> until they open it up <laughs> the rodeo's over and you just crawl out and like just cover i had clods of dirt in my hair down my shirt just everywhere so all the like i'm gonna be cute tonight and you know <laughs> Yeah, get featured by Fashion Posse or whatever. I mean, that didn't even exist yet, yeah. Jackson. <laughs> so <laughs> showing okay. my age, but like you didn't do that for that. But it's one of my favorite memories because it was insane and just very adventurous. So, yeah, definitely, mm -hmm. that's so cool. Yeah. So obviously, the the type of photography you were doing there and that you did for quite a while, um, it, there's a different approach to photographing totally. Western people in general and Western mm -hmm. events. Um, what is the difference in your opinion in that approach and kind of what would you tell someone who wants to enter, not even just photography, but just like the Western media space for that matter? Well, I mean, the Western media space has just, it's changed so much since I was in there. I mean, really what, I mean, the internet and, instant access to everything and blogging and stuff has really changed the landscape. But the biggest thing I can, I can give people as advice is just, if you are there to rub elbows with, you know, the top guys, if you're there to husband hunt or to just get close to people, it's not, that's not genuine. And people see right through that. Nobody is going to take you seriously. Um, you know, it's really important to have a purpose in doing it. And your purpose should be that you're passionate about rodeo, the Western way of life, agriculture, all of that stuff. And um, I just, I always go back to what my dad always said to me when I was a kid. Um, at junior rodeos, I would like want to, it'd be hot and want to take my long sleeve shirt off or my hat off. And he was like, listen, do you want your kids to rodeo? Well, yeah. I mean, I was like, I don't, I was probably 12 years old. And he's talking to me about, you know, his future grandkids. Do you want your kids to rodeo? And I'm like, yeah, I do. And he's like, then you have to live this lifestyle. Like you have to buy into all of it. Like we don't just wear long sleeve shirts because we are trying to have a fashion statement. Like there is a purpose to everything we do. There's a purpose to rodeo events. There's a purpose to the dress code. There is a history. And if you aren't doing what you can to help perpetuate it and make it better and educate people and, you know, be a part of the future, you will not have a future for your kids. And mm -hmm. so that was always That's like good. that lesson has always stuck with me. Yes. And um, even though I'm not necessarily still in that space now, um, I can still feel like I, you know, every time I take a picture of an FFA kid or, um, somebody with their horses or their rodeo stuff, you know, we can, we can talk about it and we can still, I can still work on doing something to give back to that lifestyle. And so you really just have to have a mindset of your purpose in doing it. And, and your purpose should be um, to give or to contribute, not to take. Yeah, and because yeah. you could spot the influencers and the, I mean, that, that wasn't even really a word back then, but like you could spot the people that were there for the wrong reasons from a mile away and nobody mm -hmm. respected them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you do have to develop relationships. Um, it's really... Trevor used to tease me for years, for years. He would always be like, you know, we'd get in the truck to go to one of Cliff's basketball games. And I don't know, if, I don't know if people know that Cliff Cooper was such an amazing basketball player, but he really <laughs> is. Like, he was amazing. Um, and Trevor would, it, teasingly, but kind of not, be like, okay, shh, there's journalists in the truck. <laughs> oh, my God. You, you know, it, it took a lot of time to, like, build that trust up to where you know, they knew they could trust me. And then he teased me about it. 
but if if people don't feel like they can trust you and they're not going to open up to you and that is one of the key components of being a journalist in general is getting your subjects to open up to you and getting a different angle on the story than the person sitting next to you you know because you bring your own perspective to something just like i bring my own perspective to photography no matter what kind of photography it's doing but you know as a journalist both print or written journalism and photojournalism you have to add your perspective and it needs to be a unique perspective than somebody else so what is your unique perspective and your ability to connect with people genuinely is going to come through and that is what is going to make you successful or not successful ultimately yeah so you went down this route and then from yes. there i guess give some background on why you decided to not necessarily leave that behind because you're still definitely involved in that industry and you do some commercial work which actually um i'd love for you to talk about some of the commercial work that you do <laughs> you've broken into the event space the western journalism space commercial photography specifically for western brands mm -hmm. and you also now focus on seniors and families and are really mm -hmm. cultivating a lot of meaning and purpose in your home community uh which i think mm -hmm. is super cool because it shows that you're not confined or limited to one path or one area of expertise like you've mm -hmm. you've really done it all I mean, I feel like I've lived several different lifetimes. Um, and I think what it all comes down to is not being afraid to pivot when you need to pivot. And and I mean, honestly, like a lot of it comes down to my faith. Um, I just want to serve where I'm supposed to be serving, whether that is in the rodeo industry or in my hometown, um, it, you know, with teenagers, I have always had a heart for teenagers. I've always had a really good rapport with them. Um, you know, Cliff Cooper was my very first senior. And um, it's so funny because now he's like, he was teasing Stone Smith. I just took his senior pictures the other day or the other day, a couple months ago, <laughs> but I was working on them the other day. Mm -hmm. And Cliff's like, oh man, my pictures were so fun. Like and he's like going on and I was like, Dude, you were a jerk at your pictures. Do you not remember? And he's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, Stone, you're going to have fun. Don't be like me. Uh, <laughs> but I just, <laughs> it was just funny little anecdote. But like, I just really saw that like, this, you know, making Cliff go from, I don't want pictures, I hate this, to enjoying it and feeling important. Um, and, and really, that's my purpose. I mean, my purpose is that this is my ministry and my goal every day is to speak life into teens and young adults. Like that's what I want to do. Um, and I hope that by interacting with me and being in front of the camera, they feel seen, they feel important. They feel just how, like I want them to feel like they're the most special human being because they are every mm -hmm. single one of them, you know, and we all have uniques and talents and we're gifted by our creator for something. And I want to be able to show them that for, you know, whatever couple hours that they interact with me. Um, so I have pivoted a little bit. Um, sometimes the Western industry can, it, it, sometimes it can seem to me, or I felt like anyway, I was more in it for self-serving reasons and not serving other reasons. And that's to me a sign, you know, I need to pivot. I want to kind of end the, the conversation about, um, like your full circle coming back to Burwell, um, you know, mm -hmm. focus on like livestock photography, how you've really like niched and specialized yourself uh, yes. and branded yourself in that way. But I want you to first talk about how you broke into commercial photography. Yes. Sometimes it can be kind of frustrating because they're like, how do I take your job? And I'm like, <laughs> no, like, listen, here's how things started. <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen. <laughs> Buckle up. Things are about to get real. And it comes back to having relationships with people and being a person that they can trust and being authentic and real and not being around people for the wrong reasons. So um, I started shooting. I've shot for several Western entities over the years um, because I would like I was involved. I would go to markets or I so we. Um, 
I shot the Miss Rodeo America pageant one year. So I developed a relationship with uh, the people at Montana. Um, and then I developed a relationship with their regular photographer. You know, it's, I always try to approach things from a building other people up standpoint. Um, but really, I kind of cut a lot of the commercial out except for STS Ranchware because it's literally my best friend's company. And everyone is always like, how did you get that? Well, <laughs> by being authentic Surprise, and making friends first. And it, I mean, it, this is how it started legitimately. I wanted to improve my skills as a family photographer. Um, I struggle sometimes with, you know, if there's ever like an area I feel like I'm weak at, I want to go work on that and make myself stronger. So I approached Shane and Jennifer at market one year, um, back when I was in Denver. And I was like, hey, I'm coming through Texas. Could I stop and take your family picture? It won't take very long. Um, I won't charge you anything, but I just need some models and you're pretty good models. And they had three kids, <laughs> but I just, I wanted to, and I do this a lot, like even still, I'm like, listen, I want to try something new. So I find like friends that are okay with just modeling and I don't have to have the pressure of like, oh, this is for something, or I have to make a sale or whatever. Like, it's just, if it doesn't turn out, oh, well, nobody's upset. Um, yeah. And Jen's like, of course, you know, why don't you plan on staying overnight? And somehow or another, it was like 12 days later. And I'm like, I really have to go. And she's <laughs> like, no. Days? I think Are I you joking? <laughs> we just like, we were, I mean, we've known each other and we've been friendly and friends. I will tell you, um, I tell everybody this about Jennifer. She doesn't even remember it. She does not remember the first time she met me. I remember the first time I met her. It was in the media room at um, a rodeo in Omaha when there used to be pro rodeo finales. And I was the copy girl. I was an intern and my job was to make copies. Love it. Love it. Color Putting coded in copies. Grease. Yes. It, it is literally the lowest job you can have in a press room. And I was like super excited to do it. So Jennifer Smith, who is like the on-air personality, like sideline reporter, walks over at the copier and she's like, hi, how are you? What's your name? Where do you go to school? And just like basically starts interviewing me. And I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you need a coffee or something? I mean... And she was so nice and friendly. So we always were friendly in the media room together. Um, and then a couple years at the NFR, when I was like down in the pit in the photo pit, like we got to be closer. So we just kind of developed this friendship over time, but I'd never stayed with them. But mm -hmm. then, yeah, I went to visit and like just didn't leave. <laughs> I was like to tell this story. I don't know. I feel like I'm telling somebody else's story now, but um, this is good. I'm always a big, like, persevere you know life will give you storms that you you know work through the storm so short so jennifer and strand had started this scs ranch where in 2011 and i want to say it was maybe 2012 or 2013 i don't remember the year exactly they just started this there was like maybe six products to launch and she got a call three weeks before the nfr that her services were no longer needed that's her story to tell, but I just happened to be there at that time. It was really devastating. At the time, it was a big part of their income. So, I mean, it's basically like getting laid off from your job three weeks before the biggest job of the year. And it was just one of those, like, we're all crying. She's like, what are, what am I going to do? Like, I, I, I need this SDS ranch to take off because I don't have a job. Like, I don't have any income now. And it was really scary. And they stepped out in faith. And, you know, I'm their friend. <laughs> I was there anyway. And she's like, look, I've got a few bags. Could you take a few pictures of them? Like, I don't have any money to really pay you. But, like, can we just do this? And we're like, I'm like, yeah, like, let's just have some fun. And um, mm -hmm. I think that she paid me in um, a pair of Ariat boots. Thank goodness we wear the same size boots. Gave me a handbag. And I still have both of them. And that was my first paycheck because I was doing my friend a favor and I did not need or expect or want anything else. And it has grown into my biggest job of the year, but you know, it wouldn't have started if I wouldn't have been like, 
hey, you're my friend. Like, like, let me help you. This is what friends do. You help each other out when things are bad, you know? Yeah. And also it's just to me, like such a great story. Like we were talking the last time I was down there and there's just all these collections and all this stuff. And they just bought a warehouse. And I'm like, um, I don't know that that's anybody else's path to getting into commercial photography, uh. but you know, it's, if I can give advice to any other photographers, there's two things I always tell them. A, go to business school. Don't get a photography degree because things change. But, you know, ultimately running the business is the hardest part of what I do. And B, develop relationships and be authentic and just live to serve other people. If you're trying to see what you can out of something, you're going to fail every time. So obviously mm -hmm. you photographed rodeo events, but that's not necessarily a posed mm -hmm. thing. So not only do you do portrait photography for people, but you've also yes. branched that into like merged the two worlds almost, yes. which makes you highly sought after <laughs> in this space because yeah. you're one of the few people who know how to do this and do it really well. So how did yes. you like find that need and then develop that niche, I guess? It, you know, it really, the roots of that really go back to um, the magazine I used to work for and Western Horseman. Um, because while a lot of those shots are lifestyle shots, which lifestyle we would consider non pose, not like just capturing things in a journalistic sense, um, I realized like, you know, if you're taking a picture of a, a really great, um, Give me a barrel racer and her horse. That's like super contemporary. Super contemporary. Haley Kinzel and sister. If you're going to go out and do a story on Haley and sister, you want a picture of them together, right? Not just an action shot of them barrel racing, like a shot of them in the barn kind of pose. So I had to learn how to do that. And so um, now that kind of stuff has evolved into my seniors or clients bring their horses and you know, I, my goal is to get a great picture of the person with their animal. So I had to learn how to pose the animal, how to use the right equipment, how to light the person and the animal. And just so there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, I'm actually giving a class on that um, in May, hopefully. But yeah, like, and I, again, went to um, one of the Western Horseman editors and I'm like, please help me with this. How do you, how do you get that? How do you, not make the horse's head look huge and their body look tiny. Um, because I mean, the other thing you have to, you have to know, and I think growing up around horses or stuff, you know, too, you certainly don't want to make a horse look ugly, especially if it's a pretty horse, especially mm -hmm. if it's a successful horse that people use for breeding. I mean, if there is one thing like, well, their hip looks too small. He's a big hipped horse. Why does his hip look small? Well, you probably didn't pose it correctly. And so I really honed in on, learning how to do that correctly and asking questions and just, I, I probably annoyed the crap out of the people that probably, I, I don't know if they really wanted to mentor me, but I was just like, Hey, how hey. do you do this? Do you have any tips? And you're <laughs> just constantly asking questions or be like, I just took this picture. Tell me what's wrong with it. And they, you know, usually people are like, Oh, like that's pretty good. I'm like, I know if it's pretty good to be on the cover, tell me what's wrong with it. And just being really teachable, really coachable. And also just having that understanding of what poses work good on humans and how to, one of my favorite things to do with horses is create a connection with the person and the animal. So if I can give somebody just like a quick tip on my favorite way um, is that I don't actually, a lot of people, want pictures riding their horses. And that's great. And I, and I do take those, but usually if you want a portrait with a horse, you want to highlight in the portrait, the connection between the human and the horse or the cow, whatever animal, you know, <laughs> I mean, show, I, we do a lot of different animals, sheep, pigs, whatever. Um, I think horses though are a lot more like dogs in that, that you have a really, they have personalities, you have a really special relationship. And so the biggest tip I can give is to show off that relationship is to get off the horse, have somebody put their arm underneath and, you know, it's, so they're kind of like face to face, you know, mm -hmm. um, if their eyes are close to each other, that automatically is 
like body language for a close relationship and connection. And so a lot of times people will look at my photos and not know why they like them or not know what it is about them that makes it special, but they'll just know they like it. And a lot mm -hmm. of times it is, they can't put their finger on it, but I can. And it is that you can see that there is a connection and there was a love between that person and their horse. So, yeah. um, that's, I, like, that's the, that's the key. I mean, you got to learn the technical stuff, but the key to it really all comes down to how do you show that connection? Kelly provided us with some really great perspective on how to use your skills where they're appreciated and where you feel like you're making an impact, especially from her transition from rodeo media to doing primarily senior work. And now I'm really excited because this is really a perfect segue to talk to Haley. Haley graduated from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, took a job with an ag tech company, then found herself getting married, returning to her home community in Ainsworth, Nebraska, really trying to figure out how to harness her love of rural communities, her interest in entrepreneurship, and this talent she had for storytelling and photography. So it's not my story to tell, but I'm excited for Haley to share that with all of you. To start, kind of give us some background on growing up. Like everyone asks you, what do you want to do with your life? Did you ever have a super concrete answer to that? Or how did that change? No, I, I kind of, I feel like lucky to know. I feel like I knew early on, like some things I was really passionate about. Um, but I never would have ever said I wanted to be a photographer. Like ever, <laughs> I would have laughed. I was like that. I don't know. I just never thought that's what I would be doing. So I always knew that I was passionate about rural communities. Like in college, like if anyone who knew me knew that there's that Haley girl that is passionate about rural communities, like that's what I really liked. And so I was always kind of thinking um, being in the angler program, like something to do with how can I have a business that serves and helps rural communities. And just with my experience kind of in high school, like I was in, I worked for our economic development office in our community in Ainsworth. And that just gave me kind of a behind the scenes view of really like all the things that go into making a community operate all the stakeholders that donate and volunteer their time for all these boards, all these different things um, to make their community a better place. And so just being a part of that when I was younger just made me really appreciate a lot of those things. And I knew that's something that I wanted to be a part of too. So I never knew what that would look like. And then it just kind of unfolded that I was kind of working for an ag tech company. I had moved back to my hometown. I was getting married and um, to someone, to Mark, and we farm and ranch in Ainsworth. And I was just thinking about, I was traveling so much outside of my community for work. And I just really wanted to be more in my community, more with the people that I love and care about. So I just started doing photography on the side and I just really enjoyed serving people. It, it's so much more than I expected in that way. I just feel like I picked photography because I wanted a creative outlet, one. And then two, I felt like it was something I could learn and master myself without a lot of, you know, investment and outside help. So that's kind of what I did. And I just really enjoyed serving people along the way. And that's allowed me to really just be home in my community more um, and just serve people who are just like me and care about things that I care about. And I love serving rural couples. It's the best. So Santos Blue offers a lot of different services, engagements, seniors, those sort of things. But your focus is really on, I guess, a brand term you've coined is small town love. So rural couples, Western couples, people in the ag industry who are looking for someone who gets it. How did you find this niche or is it something that kind of found you? Yeah, I think when I was starting, I I had just gotten married. And so I was really thinking from the perspective of what I wanted as a bride. And so, you know, when I was looking for a photographer and choosing 
someone. I just wanted them to get it. I wanted them to understand what was important to us. I wanted them to feel comfortable around cattle because <laughs> like, that's what we're passionate about. Like that's what we care about. Of course we had cattle in our engagement and wedding photos. Like that's what we care about. And so I just, me personally, I wanted someone who got that. And so that's, I feel like where it started and just being in the Ingler program, it just teaches you, I mean, you know, it just teaches you to think in the perspective you in the lens you view the world is just so different. I feel like it, you're just always questioning and thinking of things in niches, like you're saying. And so it really just came from the perspective of me as a bride that I wanted that. And so I just went for it. And I was like, other people have to want this too. There has to be a need for this. And um, it's been really fun. Like that's the number one thing of how people find me is usually they're like a farmer ranch couple or you know, they just want someone that understands small town love. Like so many photographers are based in these cities and, and I'm, it's just really fun to get to know each person's hometown through this. Yeah. So you are one of the photographers now that get it per se. Um, how do you think your approach is different, especially, I mean, when you're serving these rural people, because I, I know most rural, I don't want to single out guys, but don't necessarily enjoy getting their photo taken. And I'm sure that your approach to a photo session or just interacting with these people has to be a little bit different than if it was, you know, otherwise. Yeah, definitely. I think it just really helps to kind of understand them kind of going into it and their unique story. And so I really try even if it's just a little questionnaire, like really try to get them and what's important to them. So um, yeah, definitely guys don't always enjoy getting their photo <laughs> taken, but it's a lot of fun. One one uh, thing I've really found is that if you do take <laughs> engagement photos with cows, I try to at least put a few in the gallery of like their favorite cows. <laughs> <Get some nice laughs> portrait, you know that, so then they get something out of the gallery too. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so amazing. I have a couple grooms that have framed some of the photos of the cow. <laughs> so sometimes I leave that as a little carrot, you know. Oh my gosh. Her. That's but amazing. It's fun. it's fun. Like it's, it's casual and I just really try to make it about them. It's not about my agenda and, and my aesthetic. It's that's, I feel like the number one thing that I just really try to stay grounded in is how can I serve this couple uniquely for you know, their love story. And um, like, it's so much fun to get to know them through the engagement session. And after the first 10 minutes, it it's just kind of like we're all hanging out. And I'm always, I, I, that's my feedback I value the most is if the guy says it's fun afterwards. So it's, <laughs> it's, it is fun though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Western world kind of has this like unspoken code of just timelessness and quality and hard work and all of those things. And I think if anyone pulls up your photos, they'll really see that sort of reflected because your photo style is very timeless and elegant and not, um, not oversaturated with a certain trend or anything like that. Is that intentionally done? I feel like that kind of comes back to, I think back to when I was starting this, like what I really wanted as a bride. <laughs> like I wanted something, like I said, that didn't look trendy and can hang in your home for years and still feel like you and feel timeless. And so even when kind of wearing, we're building even like outfits and stuff, it's easy to kind of go trendy in some, especially in Western, like there's a lot of Western fashion and that's fun, but I always... Um, really encourage couples to kind of choose things that feel like them and that feel timeless. And, and that is something that, that is really important. I think it just comes back to what was important to me. Um, but also like the places and that we're taking those photos are usually like a family ranch or, or farm or something, a place that's special to them. And why not reflect that in the way like it's actually seen and, and for the beauty it is. So I think that's that's true across the industry. I think that's a unique point. Mm -hmm. So community is obviously something that's really important to you. Um, you have 
you know, deep roots in Ainsworth. That's where you are now. It's where you grew up. Um, and you've kind of created this sense of community, obviously where you live, but then also kind of online. You have a few different facets. Give us an outline of, of in your eyes, the communities that you serve. Yeah, I think one thing no one really tells you is like, it's really lonely and it's hard to move home. Like you think you're kind of going back into this place that you grew up in and, and it should be pretty easy to kind of dive back in. But I had moved around so much and luckily Mark had kind of told me, he's like, I feel like it takes, you know, a good year and a half to feel like you belong like back in your hometown. And even, even then, like, it's very lonely. It's you're cut off from a lot of your friends, like through college and everything. And so I feel like I've really um, seeked ways to deepen my community where I am. And there's so many people just like me, just like you that are, you know, living their small town, rural ag lifestyle and isolated. That's how it is. And, and so it's so fun to be able to connect with others and it just makes you feel and re- remember like you're not alone. Like there's so many people going through this each day and I feel way less alone and social media, like I don't serve social media, social media su- should serve me. And that plays out for me just in the way of the community and relationships there and friendships that are real that started online that became in person. Um, and they're, something I really, really treasure, especially just adapting back into this lifestyle and and being here because it is, it is an isolated lifestyle, but it doesn't have to be. And it's been, I'm so thankful for that. This business is really an extension of you and your values and the lifestyle that you want. But I would like you to maybe put in your own words, like what keeps you pushing to keep growing this business and to keep growing in your skills. Yeah. Like like we kind of talked about, it's just so easy to get like sucked into like your own little world, especially out here. And um, like, I just had a wedding this weekend and going into it, I was like, man, I just feel like I need to dust off the cobwebs from like winter and get (laughs) back into it. And um, we just had like the best time. And the thing that just keeps me, going and want to, you know, elevate my business each year is I just want to serve my couples the best I can. And I want to be able to give them like my whole heart on their wedding day and to be able to be present for their moments and never get burned out of that. And um, that's something I've really tried to keep at the forefront. And, and through that, like each wedding, I can, I learn more and I never want to become callous to the routine because you can go through so many weddings and it can, some of them can, you know, start to feel similar if you're not like careful and guarded and, and staying grounded and no, I'm going to serve this couple with, with all I have because this is their best day. And I think that's one of the most fun things is if you remember that it's just such a special time to be able to serve someone and and like be able to even just witness their best day their wedding day so um I feel like that's something that just really keeps keeps me going and and elevating each year to try and serve better yeah so a lot of photographers stay away from weddings because of how strenuous they are and just the the high nerves and the tight schedule and all those things um, and, and obviously you're serving these people on the best day of their life and that has to be rewarding, but what else about weddings keeps you engaged into that space? <laughs> Cause it's, it's pretty high pressure. Yeah. yeah. It's like, but that's why I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this. Yeah. It's just so intense and that's why I like it. I'm an Enneagram eight. And so I feel like I live for that intensity and I just really like it guiding a couple through that and I just love protecting the couple from stress like that's my number one goal is I just want them to be completely present not worry about anything and that's why I can kind of help guide the day um and I feel like that's something that fits really well with my personality to do really well I think there's a lot of photographers that probably are better photographer better creatively but I think I can serve 
really well because of my personality and skill set to help guide a wedding day, um, to just be completely present and see them for them. And so there's plenty of other photographers. There's so many. It's a com- such a saturated industry. But I think um, my edge is just my personality to be able to lead and serve um, auto wedding day because it is intense, but I love it. And I, I like guiding through the process. So. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> kind of more on the entrepreneurial track. You live in Ainsworth. You and your husband run cattle, operate a feedlot. You really took it upon yourself to create an opportunity where you're at. The landscape of corporate America is changing, you know, working remotely. There's more and more opportunities to do that if that's the path that you want. But you've really taken ownership of your own entrepreneurial path. Was that, walk us through when you really felt liberated, like, okay, this is something that I know I'm good at, I know I can pull off, and something that has real potential to be a long-term thing. I feel like it was gradual, but also kind of no other option so that might not make sense. But um, so I had been kind of doing it on the side. But then what happened when I was living back here, like I was working for an ag tech company and I got laid off, like they laid off a ton of people. And so it was kind of going into the winter and Mark and I talked about it and I was thinking about some other things. I even had applied for a few other things, but then I was like, I think I can really do this. And I had booked a few weddings for the next season. Um, And Mark and I really talked about it and he just gave me the space. He's like, I think you should go for it. And um, this is, like I said, not the entrepreneurial journey I thought I would choose. Um, But doing this allows me a lifestyle that I love. And I love serving my couples. I love doing all that, but I love having the freedom to be involved as much as I want each day in the farm and ranch and having kind of winter is kind of naturally an off season for weddings in Nebraska. So (laughs) um, just having that time is really refreshing to me. And I, I love the lifestyle that for, my business gives me more than even what I do, which might not sound right, but I, I still love what I do, but I love the autonomy, um, that it gives me more. (laughs) And, (laughs) um, yeah, it's just, it's super rewarding. I, I love serving my couples and I love that I can still be here and involved with everything. And we have a son Mm -hmm. who's one and just being able to be flexible, like flexibility and autonomy are my two number one drivers. And this really offers that. And I'm really, really grateful for it too. Okay. So what was your first wedding like? (laughs) Um, I, okay. I had really good help. I, I had hired my friend Sarah and she's a very experienced photographer. So I kind of like paid her to be my second shooter. Um, and she was great and just doing it together with her like honestly I was learning from her as we went through the day and it was just a really good um match up but it, the day was like a little stressful at a couple points and I just kind of got this high and kind of got addicted to it <laughs> and so I really really liked it and um and I I don't know how to it was just really, I just really enjoyed it. I knew right then that I was like, oh, I really, I really like this. And I think, um, I think this is kind of the path I wanted to do. And the best part is, is I love being able to serve, you know, other communities and serve outside of my community so that I can be here more because, you know, a lot of small businesses, like you're kind of just recirculating dollars, like in your community. And this allows me, you know, to come, mm. go outside, to come back in. And so that's something I really value too, is because I know how hard the people who live here work for their dollar and um, the people I'm serving work for their dollar. But I think it's just all around really good for the community and glad to be. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if you could offer 
someone who is considering returning to a rural community or living in a rural community for the first time, one piece of advice, what would that be? Um, I think the biggest thing I wish someone told me um, was that it would take so long to feel at home. And that's something I just wasn't expecting. I think it took me a, a good year and a half to not feel like I was under a microscope and being kind of watched, maybe isn't the way to say it, but it just <laughs> felt like I was under a microscope and I was used to kind of the anonymous side of being even in a bigger town or a city. And I didn't expect that to be such a transition. Um, but now, like, this is where I belong. Like, this is where... I want to serve. This is where I want to be. And like, I belong here. And so I think um, you just kind of have to lean in and learn a lot about yourself in that first year and a half. And it's so worth it. And it's hard, but it's, it's awesome. And I, there's nowhere I'd want to be except here. So <laughs> I just want people to know, like, this isn't something I ever thought I'd do. I am still not the expert at what I do. Um, but like, I'm no different than anyone else. I just had like the confidence to go for it and kind of brave through the mucky early stuff of seeing your work that sucked. And <laughs> it's, I'm not, I'm not the best photographer in the world. I'm not, but I'm the best for my people and I'm the best for, like, I truly believe that. And I think that's, um, something that's different is I I know like it's so saturated there's people that are amazing photographers I'm not the best in the world but I'm the best for my niche and for my people and um I think I can serve them better than anyone so that's what I feel like keeps me going in and pushing ahead um because I know like my people are out there I only need so many customers a year like I don't want I don't want 25 weddings a year I want you know, I want quality over quantity. I want to serve my people because I only have so much of myself to give and I want to be able to give them everything I have. And um, so I think those two things have really just helped guide me because there's a lot of people that take on tons of work each year and I just see them getting burned out. And I never want to get burned out when I'm like getting paid to serve someone on their wedding day. Like, mm -hmm. so... I don't know. That's just something that I, I keep thinking about. And as I move forward in, in this, it's, it's just something that I really need to stay grounded in and, and serve my people well. So, Well, I hope you enjoyed this slightly different approach to this week's episode of Breaking the Barrier. Kelly and Haley are both serving rural people, rural families, rural couples, and their hometown communities. Ultimately, media and photography are only going to get more important and more popular. And it was so much fun to get to talk with these two women who are really making strides in the Western industry and in their home communities. Thanks so much for tuning in this week. As a reminder, new episodes of Breaking the Barrier are available every Tuesday and can be found wherever you listen to podcasts. Breaking the Barrier is produced by the Rural Radio Network. <laughs>